fearless. Right. So I want to talk about the fearlessness because I don't think there's anybody in pop culture who exemplifies that as much as you do. So where does that come from? And how has it been an advantage for you over the years throughout the different well, stages of your just career? Just my experience. Like, like I've, um, I've somehow ended up in the circumstances where I've been up against the toughest things in the environment that I come out of before any success takes mm -hmm. place. And the, uh, I, I always say if there was someone, someone to run and go get, I would have ran and got them, but I have to run and get me. So I had to come back myself every time. So that it just makes me not look at what would be the great, the, the bigger situations in front of me, the harder circumstances don't seem so rough to me no more. You know, like, cause I've already been up against the toughest things, mm -hmm. the biggest obstacles. Like if you, if you, I think, uh, take this for, for granted, right? If, if, for example, if you, almost 90% of the time I'm uh, communicating with people who've achieved a higher level of education than me, right? The college graduates, things like that. And um, what I hold on to is they wouldn't have made it under the circumstances that I came up under. And, you know, if the information that you needed in the business classes were uh, in the book, if everything you needed was in the book, then the teacher would be too successful to teach the class. The A students don't usually go off to be the head of the the field that they're studying in. Like if you look at it, you know, a lot of the uh, C students and people that uh, can not just return the information long enough to pass midterms, but internalize some of the information and behaviors, that they, they uh, turn out to be more successful than those people who easily pass the class. It's, some people get in regimen, they, they get trained, they get comfortable with school, and they can just do school well. You know what I mean? And then when you put them in the real world, that's not school. So you'd say that you graduated from the real world. Yeah. <laughs> that, that Top academy. of the class <laughs> <laughs> for that. So what, you know, what, what are some, is, is there any specific examples that, that come to mind where you've realized that's really been an advantage, or is it just applied? to everything, you know? No, it, it, it is an advantage, and I, I, I go straight to the source. I'm talking to who I need to speak to, nobody in between or in front of him. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're trying to, I don't follow the chain of command. I, I go straight to the source of what I'd like to happen, you know what I mean? Because people in between would like to get you to take less to do it to impress the people at the top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you got past him to talk to the actual person, I had a, uh, so running in the sport of boxing uh, with Bob Arum, like Todd, talking mm -hmm. to Todd mm -hmm. before you get to Bob. No, I only communicate with Bob, you know, to make the deal. And there's points that he'll look at it and go, well, you know, nah, just get, just give him, make the deal. You mm -hmm. know, when, when Todd would want to impress him and get you to take less, you know, and try to squeeze things at points. Like I say, oh no, the deal was 20 tickets. We gave you 20 tickets. That's it. I said, okay, well you didn't pay me the 250 thousand to perform tonight, so go get my money, and then the show will start. Mm -hmm. And then it changes everything because you're saying at that point I was supposed to perform as an opening piece, but I'm not being compensated for that. You're telling me it's a problem with 20 tickets, like you know, just trying to play hardball. Right. At points, and there's different circumstances in business that I've been under that I've seen things and people's temperaments, different things. And it's not something that Bob Aaron would say, but it's something that Todd would. Yeah. yeah. So, you, speaking of boxing, you know, I started boxing recently. Yes. Definitely not as long as you. That's good for you. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. It's, it's been totally life changing, you know, the, no, the, the trainer that I have. Um, Billy Markle is his name. He's been mm -hmm. a, a, a tremendous positive influence for me. And I want to hear more about how a law understanding oh, helped yeah. to shape you. Age 12, I think it was, Police Athletic League, gym. Yeah, yeah. You know, what, because I imagine that was a really vulnerable time in your life, right, I guess, right. where you could have been molded, you know, for worse or for better, yeah. had someone like 
him not come along. And we had a tougher, the environment was tougher. So it was like, there was really no excuses. Like if you did what he told you to do, you would have good performance. If not, then you go home a little punch wrong. <laughs> and they didn't have weight classes. Like we didn't have people that came in like that, that were consistent. So it was like, I would be fighting a lot of kids that felt like they should be, because they were older. And it's like, yo, you know, like that, that is the mental advantage on that level. But that kind of faded after a while once I got into the groove of doing things. And I'm just fighting and it just changed my attitude anyway because it, it made me not really not care about fighting. But every time I sparred, I felt like I was in an actual fight. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it would, because I was doing it every day, it, I didn't mind being in a fight. You know, and then that I didn't adjust well because I took that right across the street with me. Like it's like right off into the neighborhood with the same stuff that I had from the gym. And it was like, I just didn't mind the altercation. So if, if someone says something and I was like, oh, like, like you want to fight? Then it, it immediately go to let's do that. I didn't mind if I had a black eye or if, if, if I had, if it didn't actually go right, it wasn't the part of it. It was just more the fight. It adjusted me to fight, you know, and it, when you when you have someone who's training you that really don't, um, I think the neighborhood had them. It, it was it was really it was rough, you know what I mean. So they they kind of taught us to not be affected by things, like to be harder than harder than the actual neighborhood that we're in. You know that's what made the element feel like that, like because the people were like all of the stuff is that I experienced with things that they would go, yeah, that, that, that shit happens. Like, it's not like, it's not new, it's not, you know, it's not odd. I feel like the best thing that good training does is actually over prepare you so that when you're in the environment where you need to carry it out, mm -hmm. you're ready for it, you're not overwhelmed, you're not taken by surprise. Yeah, it does, if you make it hurt in the gym, then it won't hurt on the night up. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you, you see, I, I just I did the Triller thing. Yes. I did, got a chance to speak at that, and that was a, uh, it was a fun experience. And I also was identified with where Evander was at after the fight. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned him possibly fight Mike Tyson. Because, mm -hmm. you know, his heart is still a champion. His body's just not doing what it would right. usually do back then. You know what right. I mean? So I saw him disappointed at the outcome of the fight. and just wanted to talk about possibilities of, of other fights instead of talking about that fight because that didn't right. go well. <laughs> you know, I, I never understood the bullying label that was always attached to you because like even in that moment with Holyfield, you, you were really empathetic. Yeah. You know, you were, you were putting yourself in his shoes and seeing where he was at. And you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, why do you think people give you that label? Well, no, when I, I get focused, right? And then anyone who's extremely focused is, is considered, can, could be considered ruthless at points. Because if they get in the way while well, I'm trying to do what I'm doing, I just knock them out the way. So they feel like it's, you're a bully, but it's, it's really me channeling on what I'm trying to do at the time. Like a lot of, even you saw Jadakiss and them just win the, mm -hmm. the versus thing, but we, we didn't actually have issues. They got they were collateral damage at that point mm -hmm. with John them because having doing a uh, hundred guns, a hundred clips off of New York it was in a time period where they were giving him resuscitating him. Yep. You know, both Jada Kiss and Fat Joe at that time period. And then when that happens, I just went off and got them too. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then it's just, in the, with the momentum in that time period. See, the reason why that st the stuff is not really exciting to me is because they're trying to rewrite the history, right? The records are already, they're already charted on Billboard. You already made the money from them. You already done that. I, I don't need to relive that part of it. Right. Experience. I, I appreciated it while I was doing it. Right. You know, but I, I watch, the, well, the most ruthless people or did you run into are going to be people that are just focused and not necessarily taking your life into consideration while they're taking theirs. So it's like the district attorney's office that she wants the conviction so she can move up and her career can be good. She'll give you 100 years. And you look and go, why, 
why so much? Like, why do you have to do that? And it was like, what? You did it. In her mind, it's, it's her doing her job and her moving up to the next level, and she'll just knock you over. You just become collateral damage, you know? And the people that, uh, I, I know, look, think, there's more ruthless people in the business world than in the street. You know, like they, they just have subtleties to their tactics. How they do things is it's more, you know. Suit and tie. Yeah, it's, just, it's not confrontational. It's just, you know, but they're doing it right in front of you. You know, how they're structuring the actual deal and, and things that they're doing. It's like taking, just taking the money for you. Look, robbery, at least it would give, give you the courtesy of showing you the gun so you can have those anxieties and feel those feelings that you would feel when you're being robbed. They'll do it on a piece of paper where you feel nothing and just rob you right there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, it's the same tactics with a different approach. And a lot of them, the, the people that do this comfortably, like handing the contract, the, the thing that they're not conditioned for is direct conflict. Mm -hmm. And that the circumstances I grew under, I absolutely have to be prepared for it. Like the fighters, they, they look good after they have eight weeks of training and they focus their mind for eight weeks straight. You got eight seconds in the street. You got eight seconds to adjust and do what you gotta do. You know what I mean? It's not like it's gonna be, we can go home and think about the fight before you, <laughs> you run into the person. I don't know, like a lot of it, each, each thing that you put up against, right? Is, is how you adjust to things too, I think when, because you're gonna have peaks and valleys or have things change in your career at, the, at a point and you feel like, is it at a high or is it at a low? You don't, you can't even, because the money is still coming in. You don't feel like there's a, a change in, in, in finances and stuff like that. But you'll see things that you go, wait, I don't understand why they're doing this. Even now, in film and television, I'll look around and go, wait, what's, what is this? Like, I don't know what they're doing. Like, why'd they pick this up? Mm -hmm. if, if, if I don't understand what's going on, then I'm not sure I'm as good as I think I am. Right? If, you, if you're confused at how the operation is, is working, then you don't know. If everything I pick is working, you feel great about that, but you go, what, what is all the other stuff that they're picking? Right. What is that? Like, how much did that equate to as far as the audience that they have at the network or why, why they're doing it? You know, and just trying to understand that. Because um, I guess eventually I'll be the network. Mm hmm You know? I think you, uh, I, I know you've heard the saying, once you're, once you're lucky, twice you're good, right? right. <laughs> but like in your case, I think it's 16 shows in development right now or something it's like 20, that? 21. 21 yeah. shows in development. One of the biggest debut albums, hip hop history. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your peaks and valleys are not like an ordinary yeah, person's not. peaks and no, valleys. That second album sold 10 million records too. I got two albums that went diamond I, and then over 35 million records sold, right? So I still have passion for music. I still, all of the theme songs will be there, right? Mm -hmm. For this job. Mm -hmm. And then other stuff that I do in between time, like I got a whole uh, soundtrack for the new BMF project. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll get a chance to tap into it there and then be within the artist community doing things and trading ideas with some of the guys that I respect, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm just having fun with it. Like if you look, I think when you, some of the, you lose some of the fun, the competitive nature, the competitive part of hip hop can allow you to not enjoy the moment at points, you know, because you, cause you get emotionally connected to the things that are happening and, and you're really angry or you start to find different energy connected to how you're creating things. And I um, miss some of it, you know, so I miss some of my run based on with that energy, just putting that out because I could just be appreciating I'm on the chart, number one, every all that time. You know I mean, I got like 13 years of being the, the, the biggest artist in hip hop, particularly in the area and style of music that I'm creating, you know? And M's been the number one artist, period. They don't never want to remember, they don't want to remember that. You know, certain things that they look at and 
they don't want to, you don't want to really remember. People that. seem to have a short memory about just how disruptive yeah. Yeah. and how. He, he's still selling more records than them. Yeah. <laughs> now, right e now. Easy. Like, so it's like, you know, like they don't want to focus on that. They want to look at everything else. Like, you know, like if I, I just want to, want to do other things away from trying to compete for, for something that um, I don't think you can have it from, from, from the perspective that I came in. Well, you can't have that forever mm -hmm. because um, I just look in general. I think that I brought an element to it that was uh, was representation of the dangerous element in inner cities, the environment, the things that go on, and it's because I was subjected to those things. I wrote music that mirrored that, and when you financially are in a great space and you move into a different stage in your actual life, you, it's, it's hard for you to continue to convey that. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I don't know if they know this, but I'm like, I'm, I'm like rich as a motherfucker. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's a lot different from writing that from writing what I was at that time. You know, and, and at, the, at that momentum, with, at the peak of everything that's going on, I wasn't even feeling the adjustment because I already had more than I needed. Like I left, when I left on the first tour, I did uh, my first run, the Rock the Mic tour, everything we did. I came back, I had $38 million in my account. Mm. And all I had was a, a one a two bedroom apartment that was $800 a month. So if you don't spend it, you know the IRS is gonna take it. Mm -hmm. So I needed the expenses, you know. So I ended up buying Mike Tyson's whole, yeah. Home in Farmington and stuff like that, different things. Like I was just into it. Like you know, even at that point, you want everybody to be with you because right. you're enjoying everything. You kind of you don't want to be. I don't want. I never wanted to be someone different. I wanted to be a better version of me. Like to have not have the restraints that I had. You know, and when you come up without finances, it seems like the biggest restraint, and uh, it makes you make that financial or, or money focus. Mm -hmm. You know, feeling like that's the answer, but there'll always be new confusion or new situations that show up. So, you know? coming coming where you came from, and then getting to where you were, you know, like you talk about this in the book too. Sometimes the hardest part about success is actually sustaining it. Yeah. So, how in the world did you manage to parlay all of that success, given where you came from, mm -hmm. given the temptations of the lifestyle, most of which you don't. Mm -hmm. participate in how how did you come to develop this understanding of all these different components that are necessary for one to not just succeed but then sustain and, and grow that success well, I, you know, mean, I imagine they weren't teaching accounting and oh, all these absolutely. other things no, uh, no. <laughs> and I lost money I lost money I just you don't see my losses like it happens you know periodically go because look I don't usually see people excited leaving the, the tables in Vegas if they didn't put chips on the table. You know, you, you make investments in different things. Sometimes they win, sometimes they don't. More losses than wins, but when you do win, you win so big, it makes up for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's that been the journey, the experience, and then when I, I shift to do things in a different way, like people look now and say, like he's, I'm, they're feeling momentum of, thing, of me in television now, right? But this, I started this 10 years ago. I did, I raised $200 million. We broke it into 10 pitches. We sold domestic rights to Lionsgate and went out and sold in the national territories as we could with those, with those films. But I did it twice. Then the relationship with Barry and Stan at, at Lionsgate and Grindstone is where the rights from BMF came from. You see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. this, these things are happening so far back that I damn to try and catch up now. You planted the seed for this six years ago, was it? Six, well, the rice was about six years ago. The, it took four and a half years for uh, us to get it to this point. I sold us to stars four and a half years ago. Hmm. This is why it, it feels the way it feels coming out, because I've been promoting it for four and a half years. You know, like if you've been, the audience already knows what BMF is, but they, they know, for them, BMF is blowing money fast because they know that the heyday of them financially 
Meech and Terry and them being in that position and what they could do financially at that point. But um, when you look at the, the origin story and you go back to Detroit and their family, like how the decisions were made to do things, they, it changes it. Man. It becomes a, a family drama with complex issues that move forward because of the choices they made with their lives. Now, when you get into street life or into that fast lifestyle, they'll tell you that the outcome is going to be you dead or in jail. That was, that was absolutely true for them mm. in this case. Now, I've had people in interviews ask me, uh, does it feel like you're glorifying drug dealers? And I'm just, I'm like, did they say that when they made Godfather? Right. Did they say that when they made Scarface? Because those feature films were, those films were made in a time period that this shit happened. That the drugs was coming and they were actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you say music is influential, how influential is it? Audio and visual? How much damage do you think that done to the inner cities? When people in the communities would see a Cuban and say, no, just insert me here in the Scarface movie. They're going to do their version of Scarface. Right? and make that lifestyle choice. When you see it happening in the innocence of a 15-year-old child making a decision, when they're not necessarily responsible for their actions because they're a minor at that point, and simplifying things, saying, how, what is the issue? We don't have the money for the rent or for mortgage. And uh, your dad is simplifying things, so he's going to work, he's coming home, he's just giving your mom his whole check and telling her to handle everything. And because the car broke down, they ain't got enough money for the mortgage. So you go in the neighborhood, you do what you can do in the street, you come back and give your parents the money. But that doesn't work because they're Christian, good Christian people. So, so this conflict that is universal conflict, that I think that, that uh, is relatable across all different cultures if they just believe in God and Christianity. It's a struggle there that's happening early on in this story that is really interesting. It, it makes uh, meets the outcast and T somebody that they think that they could possibly save. And it's just not identifying with how far gone he is mm -hmm. at those points. But li li those circumstances immediately stand out, you know, and I think it's one of the bigger differences in, uh, in the family drama that you see in Raising Canaan or the family drama and ghosts, you know, so you're later, I mean, there's so much to talk about, so much to, to tell uh, that they experienced on this journey. Like, yeah, we, get, we didn't get to Atlanta yet. You know, this is, we're in Detroit right now. Still got to get to St. Louis, still got to get to LA, still got to make it to Mexico, right? You got to meet the plug. Got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, it's a, it's a long, wild story yeah. that they had. And to your point, I think, I think, I think the glorification questions, it's, it's, it's focusing on the wrong thing. It's miss, missing the bigger picture right. entirely. Because like you said, it's universal. It, as long as a, a struggle, a human struggle exists, a story like this is it. gonna be relatable and it's gonna impact people re yeah. regardless. It's, it's, I look at, when they say that, it's because they're looking at me. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, I mm -hmm. know what it is. So I look at it and I go, okay, I got that. But there's, there's look, there's going to be people unhappy with the success that you have regardless. You know, you got, they'll, without knowing who you are, individual could look and just judge you and say, I don't like that. He had that diamond goat mm -hmm. on his neck. Why did he put that there? It got to be a certain kind of person because he, had, he liked diamonds. Mm -hmm. All right? And then they could just assume that you're, Anything they would like to register negative, they can just register it negative. Some people, they have the, uh, the trait of, like let's say the person is across the street, they look at you, they don't like you from across the street. Some people feel like the need to go across the street to say, why I'm a good person. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I genuinely don't give a fuck about how those people feel about me across the street because they don't care about me. Is it okay for me not to care about people not, that don't care about me? I mean, like, like simple things, like if you look and you go, if it would be entertaining for them to see me in crisis. Right. So if you saw that and you go, 
why would you care about a person who would like you to see you under the worst circumstances you could be under? And enjoy it. Look, look, look at Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again, pigtails, the, the, the schoolgirl dress, right? Hottest thing that she's done in music, the image of her at that point. Then when you see her with her head shaved off and she's swinging the umbrella at paparazzi, that picture is as famous as those other images of her. And th they paid for one to be marketed and promoted to the general public, big money to make a career. The other one was free. Mm -hmm. To see the confusion in her personal life going on. That was free, they promoted that for free because it was exciting to see it go down. Then when you see you go up, they'd like to see you come down it's the artist community that does this. Mm -hmm. It's the new, your fellow artists that, that does this to you. Because they look and they go, if you go up and you stay up, then I'm going to have my shot. This is why they go, oh, no, that first album, oh, the first album's fire. You don't notice everybody's first album is fire? Why do they say that? They say that each, it's every artist. They'll go Illmatic. They'll go Reasonable Doubt. They'll go Get Rich or Die Trying. They'll go every, Big Ready to Die. All these albums, the first album. They'll pick that one and say that one was a classic. No matter what they do afterwards, they won't compare mm -hmm. that material to that album, right? And I don't know, man. I think um, for me, I, it's not like I'm enjoying it. Because look, I, I try not to let things that affect me that, that I can't change. Right. You know, you can't change publicly how people perceive you at points you see the harshest things ever. You, you think the timing would just be, you just be in an emotional state where you can't really, or, or not, you're not tough at the moment. Mm -hmm. you're sensitive because you're not paying attention and you see some shit publicly that the person said about you that you go, whoa. And it really bothers you that the person just said that, no matter who you are, you know, and I just don't allow that to, to create a, I didn't allow it to create a new vulnerability for me. I allowed it to not matter. Social media seems to be just like a hive for this kind of behavior yeah, yeah. too. I mean, I'm sure you see it on your Instagram all the time. They say things you know, to people they wouldn't say to them in person. Never. Right, but never. they'll say the harshest things they can come up with to that person, that, no matter how, like, just for recreational purposes, you know, and but the person does see it at, at points. You know what I'm saying? It says, how do you respond to it? You know there's somebody out there that feels that way about you. Right. You know, and I don't know. Like, I don't think this is possible for them to, people don't, this is why music is magic, because people don't agree on much. You know what I'm sure. saying? Everybody has different views about different things that are going on. But when the song is the right song, everyone agrees yeah. to enjoy themselves to the material, right? That's the, the, that's the magic and the beauty of music that, that's there because everything else, you'll look and go, God damn, can we just figure out how to just be on the same page? It's it, difficult. It seems impossible. You, like, and, and like you were saying before, not only will they come at you a certain way online, but then other people in the online community will actually support it, like yeah, it, yeah. upvote it, whatever. And there's just this, this trend of negativity, misery, putting people down that always just spreads faster than the positive. Look, the things that are ideally attractive are just that, right? So if the person is taking care of themselves physically, because when we say social media, we're talking about communicating through photographs now. Mm -hmm. So if they take care of themselves, they're going to have pretty decent feedback. If there's nothing else going on but they're a good looking picture of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you see those people whose social media grow and they're not quite as affected by the negative things that you get from people, especially if they're not uh, being recognized. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If they're just an attractive person on there, they're fine. They don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> but when you, once you get, look, to entertain is to provoke emotions, right? Mm. So. If the person doesn't love me, I'd like for them to hate me so I can mean enough to them, right? It would just mean that I meant enough for them to have feelings towards me. Because if they don't, uh, you don't like me, then 
then I don't matter. I, I don't even I wouldn't even exist to you if you don't mm -hmm. hate me. At least let me get that energy out of you, mm -hmm. right? Either or. Is that something you've you've planned for? Is that like a strategic choice? Where if you, like, are you thinking these things through before you, you know, roll out all of these projects? Like, is is the goal to be you know polarizing? Like, pick a side, hate me, love me. Also, but you it's can't. okay as long as you care enough about it to have feelings, because mm -hmm. that's what it is to entertain. So if you think like I, I said on Oprah Winfrey, I said uh, if we can't be friends, at least let's be enemies. So at least we coexist. So my audience understands that I'm mm. not on your couch. Because now that my audience feels like I'm not on your couch because I don't want to be on your couch. Mm. Not because it's a, a place that I haven't achieved or reached. But when I identified that she thought her views on the way my music was written wouldn't allow me to come, I said I, I didn't care for her. I didn't have an issue with her. My grandmother was watching her show. You see what I'm saying? But if, once I look and I go, I can't go there, this is where an A-lister would go. So I don't go there because how you feel about my, you know, the way my music is, which is the number one and highest selling hip hop album in that time period. Like it's the highest debut on record and you don't mm -hmm. want to, you know, it's just having a different, her having a different choice from all of hip hop. Right. And the general public, because that's what bought it. You know, her views of what was right and wrong was, was different from that. And that would allow me not to be received as an A-list. Right. It doesn't make sense to me. Because it's like a, you were kind of like an anti-hero role, yeah. you know, like a you know, TV, but, like a Tony Soprano kind of thing, right? The bad it. guy, but everyone's rooting for the bad guy. Like, that's kind of the look, box you they say, were. You say anti-hero, but... Things that are, hip hop and youth culture love things that are damaged by the experience. And they listen to it, listen to how beautiful it sounds when they say it, you know, but they, they pick things that are damaged. Like, you know, if you say, uh, I say, I take you to the candy shop. She says, WAP, wet ass pussy is the song. It's, that's what the song is called, right? Now, what am I supposed to say for shock fight? That's why it's taking a little longer for me to come up with new music. Hmm. It doesn't seem like you're lost for ideas with TV, though. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. I'm having a good time. Like, well, what's the name? Just to match everything else that I'm doing. Right. And film and television and everything else. The, the music that I would say, the shit that I would say for shock value would scare you from doing business with me. Hmm. And uh, I'm building <laughs> this right now. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the bar keeps rising. Right. Because the the tolerance level is going up mm -hmm. more and more for what's perceived as shocking or not. Well, and then if you were to come it, it out now on, and raise it, no, look, it just depends on. Things are definitely getting more intense. If you look at what's just the newspaper, the type of acts that are happening every day you know so when this is why power beats out empire easy mm -hmm. being on premium is allowing you to make r-rated films each episode versus pg-13 versions so, of you know because it was similar in concept it just was a better version a mm -hmm. more graphic version of you know what they were more real more mm -hmm. heightened yeah, and they came behind it. So they said, empires are built on power. And that was a great excuse for me to attach myself to Fox's marketing campaign. Because I knew they would spend money that stars didn't have to spend on the promotions at that point. Mm. So I made that empire a power beef. The shows wasn't even on at the same time. Bro. Right. We wasn't fighting for ratings. And just, I just need to, to know that there's a, I have a problem with that. Right. The, with that. So... They would talk to Taraji or talk to Terrence Howard and say, well, 50 said he had a problem with this. How much can you talk about the show? Right. I tell you too much, they said, spoils, you fucked up the whole show. 50, you, t you said too much in the interview, you told everything. You know, these interviews are in as entertaining as the person you're talking to, not the show. Right. Like, the show's a different thing. Like, you right. Know what, I mean? you know, what would you say what you did with 
empire was similar to what you did with Kanye when no, you had no, the that was different. See, the Kanye thing was we had both done the cover of Rolling Stone. Both had albums coming out and um there was no possibility of getting back on the cover of Rolling Stone unless we were doing that competition thing. And that was a part of the, the let's make it as big as possible, like the, the biggest leverage possible going into the record. And was that collaborative? Was like, did you guys yeah. say like, okay. We had to collaborate on it to do it. It was no mm -hmm. beef. Like, if there, if right. there was beef, we couldn't stand. We stood close enough to each other to take that picture. Like right, that. that wouldn't happen if there was nah. real. No, I, I really think history has shown that wouldn't. Be. <laughs> that's not how you how you handle things. Do you think um, Do you think that's kind of like what? Do you remember the uh, Conor McGregor and Mayweather fight? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, um, apparently that was also like a collaborative thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you imagine that's how a lot of these things pan out? You know, a lot of not all of them, but a lot of a lot of it's like that. Like they're where they. At that point, they're trying to make excitement for a fight. You know what I'm saying? And build up as much, because then people are gonna hit the pay-per-view button. Mm -hmm. It directly translates into dollars for them. Mm -hmm. And then, like what we did, when I ran around, like when me and Floyd, we, when they were visibly able to see our relationship. Because Floyd, me, we've been friends since 2002. He traveled to Puerto Rico, make sure power summit, to be out there while I was, doing my thing, was already a big fan of mine and support me, you know what I'm saying? So it just was so much success that in both two different directions mm -hmm. that they didn't see it mm -hmm. until later when things slowed down a little bit and then we got a chance to hang out with each other. But there was a point where I'm looking at things and I'm going, yo, we kind of got the wrong messaging point because we're saying we got all the money in the world, we're going to burn it, we're going to get it again, so what? And they're repeatedly watching us do this and we're in the middle of a recession mm -hmm. at the time. But his numbers were going up at that point. You know what I mean? So when you say change it, he goes, nah, you do that far <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's going up. Like, you know, he said something to me one time, very simple. He said, what a prize fighter fight for. And I'm like, and he said, the prize. So it's okay for you to watch the fight. Don't nobody watch Floyd fight to see how amazing he is. They watch it for the opportunity to see him lose. Right. Because they don't like him. They don't like him because everything that he says is about money. There's nothing else. There's no values. There's no, like the people's champ, like Ali was standing for the same things. Right. The audience was standing for him. You know, he doesn't have any of that. It's just money. You know what I'm saying? And that, he knows you don't like him. Is that the point, you think? Well, it didn't matter because the numbers was going up. Right. When I was saying we should change it, I went and partnered with the United Nations World Food Program, provided a meal through the United Nations with, for every energy drink that was sold and did some different things to kind of shake that off of me after mm -hmm. I got away from Is that. Is that when you went to, was that after the trip to Kenya? Yeah. I think it was. I took the trip to Kenya for that. And um, we were talking about fear and fearlessness earlier. Mm -hmm. No fear riding around Kenya, handing out $15,000 <laughs> and uh. <laughs> no, this is, look, this is, these people, <laughs> my interactions out there is all, it's been love. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a different way to express it because it's like rough. Like it's this third world shit, bro. Mm -hmm. They just want to touch you. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like that and you go, oh shit. Like the, the energy, you'll feel like you did something wrong when it's so much energy mm -hmm. coming at points. And yeah, it's cool though. Like I've had a good experience. I've been, I've opened markets out there. Like I've been uh, Leeds, Abuja, um, uh, Wari, Africa, mm -hmm. Shell just pulled out. Now, mm. in. They had big holes in the street because they had bombs that went off in the street, stuff like that. So it's, it's a different type of energy there. Like. What is the, 
what what's been the most impactful experience that you've had up until this point you know just in your career maybe that's even like moved you personally you know like was it seeing how they were living out there and the contrast was it you know maybe even like the relationship with you and sire right i remember in the book you said that you know family was always the one thing that was difficult for you yeah you know and happy belated birthday to him too <laughs> well, yeah. um you know what what's been the most transformative thing for you well the, you know what's, what's crazy is it i know like I've, I've experienced a lot saw a lot of different things traveling but um probably the biggest thing is still my relationship with him mm. you know because he's he's been like the opportunity to get to those places came by way of that like, I don't believe I would have toured and done the same, had the same experience if I hadn't had the support of him in that time period. And it was not like I wasn't 100% prepared for it. Because he looks at it, it's the most comfortable relationship because you didn't have to over help me into the position. Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, no, nah, this is going to be next. And, the, and I did everything that I was supposed to do for it to go. So it was like, it just went. And he would he'd always ask for... Uh, he would ask, like, yo, can you do this for me? And I'm like, bro, I'm on your label. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, yeah, like, I got it. Like, you're the boss right now. Like, this is yeah. how we do this. And, but he would, he would ask me to do it. Hmm. Instead of, you know, like, I mean, like, it's, it's an interesting relationship. Because he just, he just has a, a different way of, this is why, like, even you haven't seen him perform in a film since 8 Mile. Right. And then... He shows up when I'm directing the film, and it does something to, to catapult even this success mm -hmm. to a new position because it that it's a basic gesture, a basic thing that he's doing for me. Mm -hmm. But it's still to move you up, however I can, and, and his from his ability. If he can use himself to help me, he'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's tested and proven because I didn't even. It wasn't like a, a thing for me. Randall, the, Randy, Randy Hudgens is the writer showrunner for uh, for BMF. Okay. And when I was directing episode seven, he came and said, uh, "Oh, we just need to do something. We need something like something big." Like, and I'm like, "Like what?" He was like, "If we could just get like, if we could like get Eminem to play White Boy Rick," and I'm like. Let me, let me just call him and see what he said. You know? That's awesome. And then he did it, you know what I mean? But he, he did, you don't have to do that. Like, mm -hmm. I've been, I've traveled to Detroit. They've offered me films that they want to pay him $8 million to be in the movie. And I come to him and they give me the script because they feel like he'll do it. His agents felt like that's a good idea. Now give it to 50 and then let 50 take it to them mm -hmm. and it'll work. Because he'll look at it like it would be us doing it instead of it, him going to do a movie. Like me and 50 will be on the movie, so this will give us a reason to be in the same place together for some time, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the I, like he, he would look at it and go, nah, I think we should do something like the Warriors. Like, huh. you know, like, like we should just bring that back, that energy. And it, what's crazy is, is it, it's turning more into the Warriors out here. Mm -hmm. Culturally, what's happening and cycle, like you see all of this new gang culture all over the place. Tribalism. Yes, yeah, it's starting to turn, so you, it may be a time to do that at some point. Hmm. All yeah. right, well, uh, 50, I think it's, uh, I think time's up, but I just want to ask you one more thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you could go back in time and give young Curtis one piece of advice, what would it be? I would have started writing music way earlier. I wouldn't even, I'd have skipped all of the stuff that I could have possibly, because all of this could have changed. You could have got killed long before the music started. I wasn't like threatening situations. A lot, I think that adjusts your character though. So it did turn into my behaviors in the music, the things you go through make you who you are, right? So, but I would probably skip that. Like I look at Michael Rainey, like Lil Meech and them, like they come in. These guys are over, Michael Rainey was on, the show, he was 12, bro, on power. And he's gonna be 
Boy, you gotta, you've been on forever. Like, if you've been at 12, you got the gig, and you're already working, getting money, when did you not get money? Or did you not have, he's been successful, he's gonna be able to do one of those guys that say, I've been successful my whole life. My whole life. Since 12 on the show? Now he's the lead actor on Ghost. Yeah. Like, when you see that, it's, it's incredible, man, because it's the youngest character and one of the, uh, the guys that you see but you don't see him and now he's the actual at the forefront of the show and and one of the driving forces of why he's being successful now mm -hmm. you know and I look at that and go damn like if you was putting channeling your energy earlier could you have been successful in a different way and skipped all of the harder parts of, of the actual life experience that you had and been able to do it. I think I could have entertained a little bit. I could have, I would have been able to rap, right? I just would have been saying something a little different, right? It just yeah. would have it been different in the experience. So I wouldn't have wrote the same things. True. You know, and if I could skip the, the hard parts that I went through, I'd skip it. You know, these are the things that your parents or that your people around you would try to help you to avoid, you know, telling you early, now nah, you don't want to do that. Like, you don't mm -hmm. caught up in that shit and then it's a lot of stuff that's there. Like, I would avoid them now. Look, look, they didn't even, they're not a part of, they may be a product of the success because a part of my temperament comes from it and experience and how I view things. But it's not a part of the actual success. I'm being successful doing things that are a lot different from what I was doing at that point. Mm. You know what I mean? And it, it's crazy. Like, I had a, a kid that I was mentoring for a little while that, the kid was a bad kid, bro. Like, he was just a bad kid. Right? But he was in love with everything about the, all the wrong things about me. You know what I'm saying? And in the very beginning, I'm like, yo, why does he keep doing this? Like, he would just do little things and you see it come out. Not trying to, to, to be bad, but he just can help it. And then I'm like, yo, what? So he, he would constantly talk back and go back to the things that he knew about me from prior to the success. You know, and I look and I go, yo, no, but you know, that's not what worked. And he was super smart. Like, that's not what worked. That's, that shit didn't work. You go to the jail and all of this other stuff. But that, yeah, I did that. And I'm happy that I got past that to do other things. But he, he just saw it one way. And, you know, it went on for a while. But that was one experience that I had that was interesting. That Because I really liked the kid. You know what I'm saying? And he wanted to be bad. <laughs> he just wanted to do that. Like, mm -hmm. if, it was, if I was in the street, he would be perfect to run under me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'm not doing that. You know? What do you... Uh... So what do, you, what do you do in a situation like that? Like, to salvage... You know, can you salvage the, the, the bad seed, you know? Is I, I, they, you can be positive influences for them, but there's, look, in the city, there's a million influences. This is why middle America follows the, the youth culture in, in these environments. They look to see what they're doing. They're making adult decisions early. You know what I'm saying? They, they're key. The kids are key out here. You know what I'm saying? They already made that adjustment. They already know within that culturally what they're doing, that this is their lifestyle and what they're doing. I mean, and, and the court system senses them as adults. They're still babies. They haven't developed, but they already made the choice. There's positive influences, there's negative influences, there's a lot of things around that you can actually do. Like, you look, look at YouTube, man. It's pretty much every skill set you're looking for you can find on YouTube. You can find some information about what you're trying to do on that journey, and, and not even have it be something for you to sit and read. You wa you're watching them explain it to you. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't, I don't know why you're not, it's not clearer that there's less limitations. Like, you're not limited the same way you were in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah, you didn't, you didn't have YouTube in Queens. Yeah, you didn't. None, <laughs> none of that shit was there. <laughs> none of that. Yeah, well, you was going to get the information from, to think outside of that environment. Mm -hmm and see the, the you know, possibilities of different things that you might want to do and actually be able to find information to occupy yourself with, with learning it. Yeah. You know? All right. Good. 50. Man, Thank you. I hope you. I didn't talk you to death. No.
I go, they're gonna have me doing all this shit all day. All day. <laughs> all day.